Welcome to Voices of Struggle, Women and Activism in the 1970s in Italy, a captivating podcast that transports you to a pivotal era in Italian history where women's stories take center stage. I'm your host, Erica from Laboratorio Lapsus, and together we'll embark on a journey back in time to discover the untold narratives of five women who stood at the forefront of a transformative era, challenging societal norms and contributing to the rich tapestry of the Italian landscape of the 1970s. In this podcast, we will delve deep into the context of the 1970s in Italy, focusing on women's struggles and feminist activism that characterize that era. Through interviews, testimonies, and historical analyses, we will strive to give voice to the protagonists of this extraordinary period and to understand the enduring impact that their commitment had on Italian society and beyond. Let's begin with a glimpse of context. The 1970s in Italy marked a period of profound social, political, and cultural changes with an atmosphere of fervent activism spreading through the streets, squares, and consciousness of the people. As the world grappled with epochal transformations like the tensions of the Cold War, Italy too was immersed in a phase of turbulence and transition, with women emerging as key figures in the context of an ever-evolving era. The preceding decade in Italy had already witnessed the first shocks of change, with the economic boom leading to unprecedented industrial growth. However, this growth also exposed social inequalities and the gap between classes. While 1968 has come to represent a global season of protest and change, it was translated into Italian context in a two decade long process from the early 60s to the end of the 70s. Italian streets became the stage for demonstrations, strikes, and protests, led by political and social movements that challenged the social and political norms of the time. This long 68 saw an evolution of personal and collective behaviors, especially regarding the role of the youth and women within the family and in society, which was reflected in new lifestyles and cultural consumption and production patterns. New organizations and new demands came up from almost every sector of society to represent the frustration and discontent of women, students and young people. Most notably, a new wave of class struggle within the Italian industrial sector grew outside traditional working class agencies, which peaked in the hot autumn of 1969. As we will hear from Claudia Pinelli, this year is crucial because it is the starting point of an escalation of power that could have led the Italian fragile democracy to an end. With the strategy of tension, state apparatus used diversive neo-fascist organizations, sectors of the army and public security organs to block and reverse the country's leftward shift, isolate the strongest communist party in the West and build a solid Atlanticist inspired internal balance. Terrorist attacks and massacres were the keystones of this strategy. Despite the climate of fear, the wind of change was unstoppable. Throughout the 1970s, Italy also witnessed the birth of feminist organizations committed to raising awareness and direct action. In the context of a traditionally patriarchal society, women were often confined to domestic and subordinate roles, but the 1970s would mark a crucial turning point in their struggle for emancipation and equality. Women from various walks of life joined forces in a mosaic of movements, each with specific goals, but all united by the quest for a fairer and more just future. As we will hear from Vicky Franzinetti, the fight for abortion rights in particular stood out as one of the boldest challenges undertaken by Italian women who united to assert control over their bodies and the freedom of choice. Yet, the feminist struggles of the 1970s extended beyond the realm of abortion alone. Also, the ones who chose to be mothers and have children had to challenge struggles, as we will hear from Enrica Bancelli about childcare rights and the policies around education. Women sought to challenge and rewrite cultural norms that limited their opportunities for education, career, and political participation. A profound sense of self-awareness and the importance of nurturing one's inner world while actively engaging with external challenges was at the stake, as we will hear from Barbara Di Tommaso. 
New voices emerged from the artistic and intellectual scene, while the feminist movement managed to spread its message through art, literature and comics, as we will hear from Pat Carra, contributing to laying the groundwork for a huge change in mindset. Join us as we take an exciting and in-depth look at a pivotal chapter in Italian history, exploring the stories, triumphs and challenges of the women who helped shape a brighter future for generations to come. Welcome to Voices of Struggle. Chapter 1. Claudia Pinelli. Claudia Pinelli is a living testament to the power of resilience, determination, and unwavering commitment to justice. Her life story is deeply intertwined with the tumultuous events of her time. Claudia's life became profoundly entwined with historical events, notably the tragic bombing at the Banca Nazionale dell'Agricoltura on the 12th of December 1969 in Milan. This event led to the wrongful arrest of her father and others within the anarchist movement. Claudia's journey became one of resilience, advocating for justice while battling media scrutiny and manipulative narratives. Claudia Pinelli's story, along with her family, embodies strength, resilience, and a commitment to truth and justice in the face of adversity, shedding light on the courage of those who dare to challenge the status quo. Her family's struggle for justice stands as a symbol of fight against a backdrop of political turmoil and manipulation. Claudia's journey reminds us all of the importance of standing up for what is right, even when the odds seem insurmountable and the world appears unjust. Her story is one of courage, determination, an unwavering commitment to justice, leaving an indelible mark on the annals of history. Let's hear her story. Sono Claudia Pinelli, sono nata a Milano il 21 luglio 1961. Claudia Pinelli. I was born in Milan on July 21st, 1961. I come from a family that, if we want to call it traditional, consisted of a father, mother, and an older sister who was only one year older. I understood later that our family type was not considered so traditionally normal. My father was an anarchist, a person who always upheld his values and demonstrated them through his actions. He was a partisan during his youth, studied Esperanto, the universal language that aimed to break down all language barriers, and remained consistent with the values of the resistance throughout his life, however brief it was. My mother, on the other hand, had a different background. She underwent job training that allowed her to specialize as a stenographer and typist. She was someone who always worked and was not an anarchist. She partially shared my father's values, although she was more reserved and skeptical. She didn't necessarily appreciate everything that my father brought into our home. In our home, even then, there was no distinction in gender roles. When my father returned home, my mother might have been cooking, so he made himself available for picking us children up from school, or made himself available for the family. Sometimes, he even took us to the anarchist circle where he had meetings. My father brought the world into our home to the extent that a judge would later say, Giuseppe Pinelli associated with people above his social class. We are talking about the years following the economic boom, the years from the mid-60s, 1967 to 68. There was a hope for change that swept through the world, not just in Italy, and it also reached Italy. These were years when young people identified with adults working in factories and supporting their struggles, seeking a different life for themselves, questioning patriarchal rules and changing customs. There was a desire to change the way of life, and thus, the rules that had been in place until then were questioned. There was a social reality looming. How do you stop social ferment? 
you raise the level of violence. There were deaths in the squares, workers demanding more rights, and the police firing in the squares. The police played games with their vans in the squares, provoking deaths. So, it's not that there were delusions in the square, but they were looking for different ways to be agents of change, where it wasn't just about the individual, but about the collective. Then, on December 12th, a bomb exploded at 1637 inside a bank that was open to the public. At first, it was said to be a boiler explosion. Fortunato Zini, who was an employee of the bank at the time, was told two hours after the explosion of the attack. Come, we have to reopen the bank. We already have the culprits. There was a strategy at play, one that had already been implemented in Greece during the coup d'etat in 1967. There had been previous attacks. By December 12, 1969, there were more than 145 attacks. This was the strategy of tension, as defined by an English journalist from The Observer. It aimed to increase fear, to maintain the status quo, using elements that wanted to overturn this status quo to return to a strong, fascist-inspired state che vorrebbero sovvertire questo status quo per tornare a, un, a uno stato forte di matrice fascista. Fascists were utilized in this strategy. And who were arrested? Who was blamed? Some people, some of whom were part of the anarchist movement. They probably didn't have the same view of anarchy as Pino, but Pino, along with others, got involved. They recreated this anarchist black cross which was an international solidarity structure supporting political prisoners. This way, they managed to secure enough funds for legal assistance and send them packages, books, letters, making them feel that they were not alone. They spent more than 18 months in prison as innocents and were later acquitted in 1972. They didn't plant the bombs. They were completely unrelated to the attacks, which were later attributed to the neo-fascist group Ordine Nuovo, led by Franco Freda and Giovanni Ventura. So, when we talk about the Piazza Fontana bombing, we cannot forget what happened before and what prepared for it, because the previous attacks didn't cause deaths. We remember the bombing at the Banca Nazionale dell'Agricoltura because it was the first attack that resulted in fatalities. 17 people died and more than 80 were injured. This is what the Prime Minister Rumor told the victims' families. You will be compensated. We have the culprits. My father was arrested, along with many others, on December 12th and his detention became illegal. I'm not sure if it was illegal when he entered the police station. I don't think so. He was detained with many others, underwent checks, and was then either transferred to San Vittore prison or released within 48 hours. My father was still inside the police station after 72 hours. During another interrogation, on the night between December 15th and 16th, he died, falling from the window of Commissioner Calabresi's office on the fourth floor of the Milan police headquarters on Via Fate Bene Fratelli. He crashed into the police station courtyard and did not die immediately. None of the police officers in the room went down to the courtyard. The first person to approach him and hear him realizing he was not dead, was a journalist from Lunita, who had stepped out to smoke a cigarette. He said, I heard a bustle. I thought someone had thrown a box from that window, which bounced on the ledge without making a sound. Later, I realized it was a person. Che rimbalza sul cornicione eh, senza lanciare un grido. 
dopo mi sono accorto che era una persona. None of the police officers came down. The carabinieri lieutenant who was present at the interrogation later went down. But a police officer boarded the ambulance, which had been called a few minutes before the fall, and entered the operating room, where they tried to save his life. These things happened on December 15th. Considering that the bomb exploded on a Friday afternoon at 1637, the bank was already reopened by Monday morning at 8. So they closed the gap, removed the bodies, whitewashed the walls and cleaned up. On December 15th, Pietro Valpreda was arrested in the courthouse where he was for a vilification case against the head of state for distributing leaflets against the Pope during a demonstration. He was arrested there and immediately transferred to Rome. After a quick identification by a taxi driver, who claimed to have driven him about 100 meters, he was identified as the person who had placed the bomb inside the Banca Nazionale dell'Agricoltura. Alongside Pietro Valpreda, who served three and a half years in prison, there were five other people accused. They should also be remembered because your life changes radically when you experience something like this and rebuilding is not easy. Pietro Valpreda told me, fortunately, I knew how to dance and in the confined space of prison, in the cell, I continued to dance. On the same day, December 15th, the funerals of the Piazza Fontana victims took place, a record time. The bomb had exploded on a Friday and the funerals were held on Monday. The atmosphere was extremely tense. There was a fear of a coup d'etat, a truly oppressive atmosphere, much like the weather that day. The unions gave a very strong response. At the time, the unions were active and they convened for three days and three nights, deciding on a general strike, providing a strong response. While the message that came through was, be afraid, be afraid, because on December 12th, a bomb exploded at the Banca Nazionale dell'Agricoltura. Another unexploded bomb was found inside the Banca Commerciale in Piazza della Scala and three bombs in Rome, all around the same time, at the Altare della Patria, at the Museum of the Risorgimento, in the basement of the Banca Nazionale del Lavoro, five bombs. So the message was, be afraid, as it happened, it will happen again. And so, the courage displayed by the people attending the funerals, what they had to go through. They were people in solidarity, saddened, aware of what fascism was, aware that they didn't want it to return. But anarchists were blamed, and they remained accused of this crime for years. This is what happened between December 12th and 15th. At our doorstep, just as the first person by Pino's side was a journalist, journalists will arrive at our door as well. We were followed by photographers when we left the house. At the time, we lived on Via Morgantini, and there were photographers along the way to the bus stop, especially on the first day of school. Some photographers even entered the school and then sold the photos to magazines. What they hurled at Pino was extremely disgraceful, absolutely unfounded, but they didn't think that anyone would oppose their version. Who was Pino Pinelli, a railway worker, an anarchist? I always say, when a judge told my mother, but we didn't think an anarchist had so many friends. They didn't think that the death of a person inside a police station would arouse indignation, a challenge to official truths. They didn't think that a widow would report a police commissioner. The complaint didn't lead to anything, but it also required courage. 
a nulla di fatto, ma anche per fare quello ci voleva coraggio. My mother set a very strong and important example because she didn't let herself be destroyed or consumed by grief. My mother also told me about the difficulty of giving interviews, but then she was convinced that they needed to provide another version to break this narrative. But you don't have to be like Licia Pinelli to achieve truth and justice. Per, per avere verità e giustizia. Why should everything fall on one woman? She should become a symbol for everything, including all the infamies that were heaped on her, all the attempts at manipulation, the fact that she was a young woman and therefore everyone thought she could be instrumentalized. Tutti i tentativi di manipolazione, dal fatto che sei una giovane donna e quindi tutti pensano che sei strumentalizzabile. You have to become a rock. You learn that over time. You have to go and defend yourself. But you have to learn to defend yourself because the enemies are many. They have more weapons than you, even those who claim to be your friends. Many times they just want to instrumentalize you or tell you what to do. The role of women, they don't choose it. So what drives them? It would be heroic to say the desire for justice, for truth. I say anger, yes, anger. Anger and the ability to process this anger in a way that doesn't destroy you. Trying to find paths, even within the legal system, is difficult. I don't know if any of the women I've met chose this path. It was imposed on them. They had to take on this responsibility because many times they were alone. Families were left alone and it should be the families that take action. Just like now, it's not the institutions that will seek the truth when someone dies at the hands of a uniformed officer or within an institution, whether it's a police station, a prison or a psychiatric hospital. It's not the institutions that will try to find the truth. It's the families that have to be strong enough, in a broad sense because you have to be morally strong, as it creates a situation where you come into the spotlight and your life is completely disrupted to find any foothold that justifies their version. And economically, because you have to pay for all the expert reports, pay the lawyers, you have to be strong, but who wants to be strong? Who wouldn't want to say, someone else will take care of it? The thing is, there is no one else to take care of it if you don't. How much strength do you need, even to endure all of this? Terrible crimes happen within institutions like psychiatric hospitals and prisons. Maybe there aren't any families. Or maybe there are families that don't have enough tools to face this. Why do we ask such a thing of them? Licia had cultural tools that allowed her to keep going. But it's not a given. It's not at all obvious. Passing the baton later is something else. It's simply not letting Pino fall. What my mother Licia has been carrying on and what my grandmother Rosa, Pino's mother, endured with all these men who died. I mean, Pino died and a month later his father died, Giovanni, Licia's father, and Pino's father died in 1972. Only women were left. I used to think all the men were dying, that the world would truly be a world of women because men couldn't handle it. 
That's what I thought. And maybe... <laughs> Chapter 2 Vicky Franzinetti Trigger warning. This interview explicitly discusses the topic of abortion and women's reproductive health. If the subject matter is too sensitive for you, you can skip this chapter and proceed to the third chapter. Vicky Frazzanetti is a remarkable individual with a diverse and inspiring background. Arriving in Turin in 68, Vicky witnessed significant cultural shifts during the transformative period of the late 1960s. With a keen awareness of societal challenges, Vicky became an advocate for women's rights, particularly focusing on reproductive freedom. She played a pivotal role in establishing networks for safe and accessible abortions, contributing to changing Italy's laws and attitudes towards women's health. Her efforts helped set up clinics, enabling women to access vital services. Beyond her activism, Vicky's dedication to education and women's empowerment is evident. Her commitment to social change, coupled with her strong organizational skills, had a profound impact on the lives of countless individuals. In a broader context, Vicky's journey reflects the era's seismic shifts, including the fight for women's rights, changing attitudes towards sexuality, and the power of collective action. Through her involvement, Vicky Frazzanetti continues to inspire us with her unwavering determination to make a positive difference. Let's hear her story. I was born in Cardiff on July 6, 1953. I lived in various countries before the age of 14. I lived in Great Britain. I lived in Italy. I lived in Switzerland. In 68, I arrived in Turin in 67, 68. At that time, I found Italy to be much behind. There was no divorce, no contraception, no abortion. Just think about it. In this sense, it was a much more Catholic country where the weight of Catholicism was felt, especially if you think about what London was like in the late 60s. Arriving in Turin was quite a cultural shock, apart from the fact that everyone wore skirts two inches below the knees, while in Great Britain it was two inches below the hip, but it was a much more closed world and very dominated by fiat in Turin very much. Then it erupted in 68, first in Paris, I took a train and I went to Paris, for example. This thing here wasn't used, but I didn't have any language problems, so I went to see what May 68 was all about. I had left home, I was working, so I did what I wanted. Why I continued to go to school is a mystery I've never solved because I could have quit. And I don't think I would have left home if it wasn't for 68, because we had the idea that we had changed the world. This is a pretty strong idea. It's very difficult to explain to someone of your age that the distance between 68 and now is the same as the distance between 68 and World War I, the first one. In 2018, it was exactly the same distance. So the changes that had occurred and then Italy had been under fascism, were only 20 years. It had only been 20 years since people stopped shooting each other. 20 years means that if someone was 20 years old at the time, they were 40 and 68. If someone was 30 years old at the time, they were 50. So many different worlds coexisted, in my opinion. They were illiterate in Italy, meaning they couldn't read or write, or they could read and write a little. Discrimination between men and women was allowed. Patriarchy was allowed. Abortion was a crime against the purity of the Aryan race, which was one of the reasons why Catholics had difficulty defending the ban, because the law had to be changed, as it was no longer fashionable to say it was a crime against the purity of the Aryan race. So there were all these worlds, the many laws that came from fascism, and then the idea of changing the world, which wasn't just Italian, it was happening in many parts of the world. 
It was also the period of sexual liberation, the so-called sexual liberation. Contraceptives were prohibited in Italy until, I don't remember exactly, well, some contraceptives until 78, for example, the intrauterine device. Others, like condoms, were only sold as prophylactics, meaning to prevent women from passing bad diseases to men. These were also the years of the birth control pill. People went to Switzerland to get the pill, buying it as a menstrual regulator, and then women came back with these things or methods. But certainly it's the time when sex is separated from lifelong commitment. So I started working with Lada Continua in Turin, and practically, not at the same time, but about six or seven months later, I started looking for women's groups. There was Revolta Femminile there. There were various groups of this kind which, as I mentioned, were quite separate from the student movement, student workers, etc. The women in these groups were either mothers or married, or in relationships. We considered ourselves more like daughters at the beginning, and therefore closer to the males than to the older women who we perceived as mothers, let's say, as mother figures. So your affinity wasn't recognized with that of other women. It took the behavior of the males to make you understand this, but that's how it was. So the gap with these women was very wide, because they were reworking an experience that was very different from ours. And they didn't participate in this movement that was then called the student movement, later the student worker movement. But clearly the fact that some of us from these groups went, went because we had some needs. Quindi io arrivo in queste organizzazioni, diciamo in questo caso specifico in lotta continua. So I join these organizations, in this specific case, Lotta Continua. But at the same time, I start looking for women's groups with difficulty. But then it happens that the organization set up, because I certainly wasn't the only one with this idea, they set up women's committees, and then groups were formed outside of that. The group that I and some others formed was called Yo Sono Curiosa, I Am Curious. We made a little newspaper. We were mostly women of my generation. Not only there were a few who were a bit older and then later a few who were a bit younger. So, I had an illegal abortion. And I said, never again for me, and never again for others. And with some others, we started thinking, this happened in different cities, more or less at the same time. In fact, we formed a network. The network was Turin, Milan, but there were many cities, Turin, Milan, Rome, Venice, Bologna, and every now and then we would meet. We thought of setting up clinics, centers for women's health, we used gynecologists for examinations, and then abortions, of course, they didn't perform them. A group of us did, or we sent women to Great Britain or the Netherlands. Initially in Great Britain and the Netherlands, then only in Great Britain, because the clinics gave us better conditions because it was business for them. What we did was that those who could go, went, and those who couldn't go, for example, because they didn't have a passport, because a passport was needed. Many women didn't have a passport, or for other reasons. They had young children, etc. And we did it in Turin if they could, and they gave money, which was put into a fund for these others. The clinic screened, let's say, the women and those who couldn't leave were brought to our group, which was called the intervention group, and we performed the abortions. We usually did them at one of their homes. Sometimes the women did it secretly. Keep in mind that there was no contraception, meaning the number of unwanted pregnancies was very high. We performed the procedure. Then they were seen by the gynecologist the following week. Dal, uh, 
I learned from EMILAC in France. In France, there were two organizations called EMILAC and Choisir. The Choisir is the more legal part, dealing with rights, lawsuits, etc. And EMILAC instead performed the procedures. They taught us with the Carmen method, we used a reversed bicycle pump. It's not difficult. I was fortunate, because in my opinion, there's an element of luck as well as skill, but also luck that I never had a case go wrong in all those years. But that's also luck. Our commitment was that at that point, if something went wrong, we would take her to the hospital and go to jail. Because that's how it was. That's how it was. But we only did it up to eight weeks. We didn't go beyond that. Beyond that, they had to go to the hospital and so to clinics in Great Britain. Contraception has changed many things. Because then one underestimates. Maybe I believe I underestimated. The impact of some things compared to others. Contraception in general and abortion have changed. They've changed more than I thought. The laws, which had also been the result of struggles. Divorce law in 70, divorce referendum in 74, when Andriotti said, your wives will run away with your maids. Contraception permitted. Some types of contraception in 71, on March 10th. Abortion in 78, parity law in 77. Equal opportunities in 2009 and 2004. Family rights in 75, sexual violence in 96. These are the milestones. When abortion passed in Italy in 78, families were large. That meant more work, more of everything, less attention on an individual. In my past, there was much more attention to problems that affected many people, rather than a few or a limited number. That is, the issue of abortion, rather than wage increases or access to university, affected millions of people. And there was a conscious attention to this. While now it seems to me that some issues, even if they concern few people, become decisive in that way, this to me is a significant change. Chapter 3 Enrico Bancelli Enrica Bancelli is a remarkable individual who has contributed to women and children well-being and access to basic rights. Enrica's innate resistance to authority led her to challenge societal norms, believing in the equality of all individuals. Her passion for children led her to embrace a career as an educator, even during the early days of daycare centers in Italy. Faced with inadequate resources, she courageously occupied a municipal office to bring attention to the struggles of educators. Her dedication to nurturing young minds and advocating for change defines her as a compassionate and resilient advocate for education and social justice. Let's hear her story. Enrica Rosa Maria Bancelli, 3107, 1955. Enrica Rosa Maria Bancelli, born on July 31st, 1955. I grew up in Isola, which was an area of workers back then. It was a fairly poor area, not extremely poor because everyone had a job, but it was mainly a working-class environment. I was born when my mother was already 40 years old, so I was somewhat pampered and a bit left to myself, but much freer than my siblings. My father passed away early, so I became even more independent, in the sense that my mother had let go of all constraints. She was a very open and intelligent person considering the context in which she was born in 1912, so she could have been much more closed off, but she wasn't. She always pushed me and my sister to work, to have a job that could make us self-reliant.
She helped me make some decisions about my life in short. Well, I was already, let's say, not rebellious, but I was a bit resistant to authority. I start from the idea that we're all equal, meaning you might be rich and lucky, sure, fine, but I'm intelligent, you're not, and okay, that's that. It really bothered me, and as I grew up, I realized that if I didn't stand up for myself, no one else would do it in my place. We're all in this world to be useful in some way. Everyone has their own peace if they succeed. We need to do our best in short. After finishing middle school, I had to make a choice, right? And I always had a passion for children. I wanted to be a teacher at all costs. Daycare centers. They weren't even being talked about back then. And then there came this first law about daycare centers, the law 1044 in the 71, which opened up a bit of a possibility. It wasn't the old ONMI anymore, which was, by the way, the National Foundation for Infancy and Maternity, founded by fascist rule in 1925. It wasn't just about material assistance for women, because after the war, clearly there was a lack of food, there was nothing. So, they provided at least physical, material sustenance and assistance for the children. There was a doctor, etc. The ONMI was a place where you left your child because you had to go to work, and there you knew absolutely nothing. You'd leave your child dressed, a coat, a hat. From this window, there were these big windows, there were corridors and big windows. You'd hand your child over like that and you didn't know. They took the child, closed this window, and until you came to pick them up, you didn't know what they were doing because you didn't know. You couldn't enter, you couldn't have any dialogue. Also because these poor ladies who worked there, they had no educational background whatsoever. They were people who had no information, just put there, after all, they watch all the children, right? What's needed, right? You're a mother, yes, so you know how to deal with children, that's enough. Very old-fashioned setup. These poor women who worked there, they were already almost 70 years old and had trouble walking. With all these emaciated children following them around, doing nothing. These little children crying in their cribs, both I and the others were like, this can't be, what is this? I stayed. Such a thing is not possible, right? Something needs to be done. <laughs> From there we transitioned with this law to consider daycare centres as support for families, but on a deeper level too, right? And so, then there was the first regional training for daycare centres. A six-month course, regional for daycare centres, was in 74. I immediately jumped at it. For me, young children were my greatest aspiration. After that, the first daycare centres started. They began building them. The first one was on Fulvio Testi Street, after that, there were many, around 40. They followed one after the other because there was another law that mandated building daycare centers and kindergartens when new neighborhoods were established. So, they started hiring. All the hires they made, 20, 21, but that was really the age, right? So, we were all very young all without experience because some had worked at summer camps, some had done some substitute teaching, but on the nursery level, so we were all pretty much new, we knew only what they had taught us, but no practical experience. And so, we started making this daycare centre work, without anything because the only thing the municipality of Milan gave us were a bunch of plastic dolls of Snow White and the seven dwarfs and some bowling pins. 
And that's it. And so we said, what can we do with these things? Nothing. There was a period when we were always understaffed, right? And sometimes we asked parents to pick up their children earlier, because if the one in charge of closing came a little earlier, we could manage lunch, diaper changes, nap time, well, for the little ones. So we asked parents a few times. In the end, we had a meeting and said, we can't handle it here because we don't like asking you to pick them up earlier. And from above, they shoot us down every time. Oh no, absolutely not possible. But we were really struggling during that period. So what do we do? What don't we do? I said, idea. Let's try to go upstairs and occupy the office. See if maybe with this action of ours, they'll give us the opportunity to create these substitute lists, something like that. So we got in touch with the parents, we coordinated. Those who brought the children, those who could come with us to bring the children. And we, in our cars, a grey Fiat 500, I remember. We set up the changing area, brought some toys, etc. Our colleague, who we're still good friends with, a daycare assistant, and she was very good at taking photos. She took a black and white film to make sure. She said, so at least we can give it to the newspapers. <laughs> and so we went. We arrived there. Nothing. They clearly didn't expect us because we arrived in a group with all the children and we occupied the office. We occupied the office because we said, we can't take it anymore. We'll give you a taste of what we do during the day. So we got in there, changed the children, fed them. The cook arrived with thermos to feed the children. And they were very... They didn't know what to do anymore. Then the manager came and promised right there in front of the parents that they would send us substitutes, which did indeed happen. So, this thing brought us closer together because the parents supported us. They really, because they realized we were in a really bad situation, in the sense, you have to put yourself out there a little, but for sure. Because if you want to be an educator without saying, I'm a teacher, you're there and I'm here, it doesn't work. It will never work. Chapter 4 Pat Cara. Pat Caro is an Italian artist and feminist activist whose life and work are characterized by a profound commitment to social change and self-expression. Pat has always been a passionate comic artist, using her drawings to explore complex themes in her personal life, politics and feminism. Cara's unique style blends simplicity, irony with powerful messaging, creating a visual language that speaks directly to the heart. Cara's involvement in politics began with her participation in social movements in the late 1970s, inspired by events like the coup in Chile. However, it was feminism that became her true calling. She became deeply involved in the feminist movement, particularly in Milan, and played a vital role in the Women's Library, a feminist hub that fostered discussion, self-awareness and activism. Her artwork often tackles profound social and political issues, including violence against women and the impact of war. Throughout her life, Pat Cara has been a symbol of authenticity, courage, and the power of artistic expression to drive social change. Her contributions to feminism and her ability to navigate complex emotional and political terrain through her art make her a revered figure in both the feminist and artistic community. Let's hear her story. Sono Pat Carra, sta per Patrizia, 
Sono nata a Parma il 17 ottobre del 1954, così si sa che sono bilancia. I am Pat Cara, short for Patrizia. I was born in Parma on October 17, 1954, which makes me a Libra. I've always been a draw, a witness to both family life and feminist politics, as well as in my personal relationships. For me, the way to understand has always been through creating comics. It's my way of meditating, of lightening things up. I come from a family of women. We were four sisters and I have a twin sister. We were the youngest of four sisters and our father passed away when we were just nine years old. Our mother was very independent, lively and dynamic and our grandmother, though silent, was very present. I observed, I believe, each one of them and in some way I think I loved each one of them very attentively. It was a melodramatic family, with an effect that has become almost tragicomic for me. Something I worked on from the beginning, especially after our father's death, it was born from this mixture, let's say, of very Emilian, especially Parmesan humour, but also economic and relational tragedies, complex knots among women that had been passed down through generations. I believe my talent was necessary. I became the humorous, light-hearted voice, yet one that passed through all the emotions that lead to humor as a survival necessity. So a series of political emotions, even political among women, important things happening among women, knots among women, compelled me to create little plays, imitations, pranks, big pranks. Che mi ha obbligata a fare subito teatrini, imitazioni, scherzi, grandi scherzi. For me, the thing that was always said in the family, and something I still carry with me now, is that I used to ask strange, difficult and uncomfortable questions. The real entry into politics and political engagement happened before feminism. It happened with the movements and the coup in Chile, like many of my generation. Prima del feminismo è avvenuto con i movimenti e con i golpi in Cile come tante della, della mia generazione, quindi avevo 18, 19 anni. Non è... È stato so I was 18, 19. It was truly feminism, the first feminist groups, and my first political commitment where I had no doubts. That's where I fully committed myself. The early feminist groups were characterized by a focus on self-exploration. They were self-awareness groups. During those years, such groups emerged worldwide, though they had started earlier in the United States. It was a powerful phenomenon. In America avevano cominciato un po' prima, ma insomma lì è stato una una cosa fortissima. This feminism also drew heavily from psychoanalysis, a form of politics that involved self-awareness, self-realization and self-consciousness. Tutto coscienza, presa di coscienza e consapevolezza di sé che attingeva anche se criticamente a strumenti psicoanalitici. Even though it critically engaged with psychoanalytic tools, some were more familiar with them than others. It was a politics of relationships rather than public protests, not about marching in the streets, you see. It was mainly focused on self-awareness. I remember it as a miracle, a space where you could talk about everything, including ourselves, simple things, relationships with these comrades, which were political relationships, as well as discussions about sexuality, love, labor, exploitation, everything that feminism ultimately became. It was a remarkable novelty. It wasn't quite like what I could do at home with my sisters. It was a complete sense of liberation something I didn't even know I could discuss. Then the centrality of relationships among women became a theme. The relationship between women was central in interpreting the world, in political experiences, and in the potential for change. Nothing else but the relationship between women. 
Then, in 75, in Milan, the women's library on Via Dogana too opened, which in turn was inspired by the women in Paris and the women's library des femmes, the MLF, Psyche Po. I believe I attended this library more than I attended the state university, to be honest. The transition was from self-awareness to a more action-oriented politics because we were opening spaces, a library, a bookstore, forming groups that produced documents. The library produced a lot of documentation, from the publication called Sotto Sopra to the Via Dogana magazine. We made groups. The first time I felt truly passionate, perhaps because I published my first comics in a publication, was with the mothers of all of us. It was the result of two years of discussions that took place on Thursdays in the basement of the women's library. Everyone smoked. I didn't. I got bronchitis easily. It was a joint reading of novels, and there we highlighted our favourites from Jane Austen to Frances Hodgson Burnett. But by discussing novels, we were talking about ourselves. I came to Milan in 77, after the early years of self-awareness, and the groups I joined started to change. However, it was my entire life, living in a feminist commune, continuously discussing this, interpreting relationships which were sometimes complex. We read the emotions between us. If there was envy, it was an emotion we could understand and explore together. Lì è stato erano i momenti in cui riuscivamo a leggere il perché il per come. Not just something destructive, but a desire for something the other had, an attempt to escape from female misery. Qualcosa che l'altra aveva era un tentativo di uscire dalla miseria femminile. It was something that constructed a life elsewhere built in these relationships. In un altrove che che andavi costruendo in queste relazioni. In the groups I was part of, there was never a vote to make decisions. In fact, we always criticised it. It wasn't that way. It wasn't that type of democracy. You couldn't define it as democratic. These were groups where the relationship was at stake, to the extent that we could sometimes take wrong turns. But there was a recognition of the authority of one's words or another's. It was what's been called the politics of desire, which allowed you to believe in it. It was a deep dive into a search for authenticity. Often these groups were for discussion and sometimes they led to publications and for me to drawing. For me it was a in a research proprio di un'autenticità, ecco mia. Molto spesso i gruppi hanno, sono stati di discussione e hanno portato, a volte sì, a volte no, delle pubblicazioni. E per me al disegno. Bringing together a simple, non-academic hand with a message. I made cartoons about massacres and I followed counter-information closely because that's where it started. I became passionate about counter-information in comics, but always with my unique style. I always added an element where terrorism, war and violence against women intersected. Questo appassionarsi anche nel fumetto alla controinformazione, però sempre con il taglio particolare che do io, per cui faccio sempre un taglio in cui stragismo, guerra e violenza sulle donne si incrociano. Vedo che in alcune si cimentano sulla violenza. Nowadays I see that some are tackling violence, which is very positive. I also notice that they don't fall into victimization. They seem like important things that are happening. 
Irony isn't something you choose as a profession. You need it. You really need it early in life. Maybe you also have a talent for it, which people admire. But it's something that arises from challenging circumstances, a bit of a rugged terrain. Those who have that talent and don't recognize it, or are a bit afraid of it or at risk. I'd say it takes courage, courage and some friends who won't preach to you. And if there are those who preach to you, they become characters in your work, in your creations. Chapter 5 Barbara Di Tommaso Barbara Di Tommaso, born in Trieste in 1960, is a woman of deep curiosity. Growing up in a family that moved from Trieste to Milan in the 1960s, she developed a strong sense of social awareness and activism. Her early involvement in scouting and engagement with diverse political groups opened her eyes to the complexities of the world around her. Barbara's journey reflects her determination to explore and challenge societal norms. She actively participated in protests and engaged in ideological debates, all while navigating a male-dominated environment. Her commitment to feminist ideals led her to establish supportive networks of women, fostering a sense of sisterhood and empowerment. She embodies a profound sense of self-awareness and the importance of nurturing one's inner world while actively engaging with external challenges. Barbara's life story is a testament to her enduring dedication to social and political change, driven by a desire to better understand the world and to create a more equitable future. Let's hear her story. Sono Barbara Di Tommaso, nata a Trieste il 21 maggio del 1960. I am Barbara Di Tommaso born in Trieste on May 21, 1960. I grew up in a migrant family, moving from east to west, or rather from Trieste to Milan in the 1960s, as part of the typical labour migration. My parents married very young, more out of convention than conviction, I must say, but with affection. They had three children, I am the second and there are two other boys. We were a very regular traditional Catholic family, but coming from Trieste, a very unique city, there was something different compared to the Milanese context. Trieste, città molto particolare, c'era un che di diverso rispetto al contesto milanese. We came to live in an outlying suburb of the city, with my father going from house to house selling products, a typical story of the 1960s, I would say. But there was also a growth and improvement in the family's living conditions because my father worked very hard. My mother reluctantly played the role of a housewife, and the children all in all, were quite obedient and regular. When they say that it takes a village to raise a child, I think there is nothing more true. I know I had a village, and I know I had other parents and adults as references who were more politically engaged, more educated, and more cultured than mine. They were the parents of a classmate, a close friend in particular. Through school socialization, I found an important support for my interests and curiosity. I like to think of myself as curious, and I don't know if it's related to activism or militancy, but it's related to being in the world, to the desire to learn and understand. These things still intrigue me, even though I'm no longer in my 20s. C'entra con la voglia di apprendere e comprendere e queste cose mi intrigano ancora adesso che non ho proprio vent'anni. I must say that being sent to be a scout from the age of eight, all three of us, opened us up to a world of social interaction, attention to social issues and what was happening around us and among us. Al contesto, ai problemi sociali, al, così, a quello che succedeva intorno a noi e tra noi as citizens, as young human beings, and more. It was a great awakening, it was a Catholic scouting group, and my family had a Catholic background. 
but it was an engaged Catholicism that became increasingly militant over time. Che poi è diventato anche militante nel tempo, è diventato sempre più per certi versi anche militante. In those years, scouting, even the Catholic Ajishi, was very active in terms of social issues and perhaps even politics. Aveva avuto delle impennate, delle aperture di movimento e di anche posizionamento politico molto molto interessanti. In quegli anni lo scoutismo anche Ajishi, cioè cattoli, area cattolica, era molto mobilitato sul fronte dell'attenzione al sociale e forse anche alla politica. I participated in my first proper protest at the age of 12. I have to laugh thinking about it now, against the privatization of the Monza Park, a park that includes a racetrack where the Grand Prix will take place the day after tomorrow. So, with the Scouts and some early environmental groups like WWF, we organized demonstrations to defend the park for public use. We always discussed things. That was the beauty of Scouting. We walked, we discussed, we thought, and we tried to do things. We were many young people and that's not to be underestimated. Today, young people are few in Italy, and they know it. They are few and dispersed. We were many and cohesive because we lived more together, spent less time at home or with devices. We lived differently. You could feel that this had an influence on the historical moment, on the context. Being in a large protest, even if we weren't always many, made you feel like you had power over things. You had responsibility and power. It was actually a great training ground for autonomy, responsibility, awareness and participation. This was in 1974 to 1976, and I had a lot of interest and curiosity about what was happening in schools. I remember the occupations and picket lines. So, I had this curiosity to understand more about what I felt was happening politically and in terms of movements, like the echoes of the 68 movement that reached me even when I was little. This politicized high school, I approached it with curiosity and I have very vivid memories of the first assembly where an 18-year-old boy talked about the Fifth Duma and what Lenin had said in the Fifth Duma. Parlava della Quinta Duma e di che cosa aveva detto Lenin nella Quinta Duma. Wow, he talks about these things. Will I ever understand them? What are they? What do they have to do with me, with us teenagers here? So there was the beauty and the challenge of ideology. And I sensed that from that initial encounter. L'ho percepito da quel primo imprinting, da quel primo approccio. In my school, there were fairly strong political groups. Politici anche abbastanza tosti. Avanguardia Operaia, Movimento Laboratori per il Socialismo o Movimento Studentesco. Workers' Vanguard, Workers for Socialism, Student Movement and a very interesting anarchist group that intrigued me initially. I had this idea of exploring and seeing what really appealed to me. Amid all this politicization at school, with the big ideas and daily events, there were male leaders who were very capable, competent and well-educated, and there was a group of women who made photocopies, and I mean it literally, that's what they did. They used a mimeograph machine because that's what was used at the time. Initially, I felt a bit alone, because the adherence to the male and group-based ideological model was strong. There was a sense of exclusion, but fortunately, within a relatively short time, several women decided to experiment with something different. We created groups, perhaps not by chance rooted in Catholicism, but engaged in doing something different. Ha portato a creare anche dei gruppi forse non a caso di matrice anche cattolica ma impegnata a fare qualcosa di diverso so we formed the gruppo confronto confrontation group which was a significant presence of catholic activists on the left in my school and beyond nella mia scuola non solo ovviamente then there was what we can call the feminist movement but of course it had its reasons stories and diverse figures in different contexts in diversi contesti in my case, we were schoolmates, classmates, and even part of some battles, some group battles, you could say. We belonged to groups but didn't feel entirely comfortable in those groups, 
So we started looking into each other's eyes, discussing our discomfort and trying out different forms. This included self-awareness. Mixed personal and political confidences, dialogue, discussions with older women, discussions among ourselves, talking about our bodies, but not just our bodies. It was about our bodies in the world. This actually rebalanced things for me. It was another arena for responsibility, awareness and significant social interaction because we exchanged important and profound things, much deeper things, not just because we talked about our bodies, but because the attitude was different. It wasn't just about referring to the international situation and our tasks, as was often the case back then. There was also an aspect of self-reflection about how we were trying to practice the values we claimed to be committed to. With a thousand contradictions, ambiguities and even competition, but also a sense of daring. Daring to do things differently in an unfriendly environment because there were criticisms, teasing, devaluations and conflicts with our male comrades. There were difficulties at both personal and group levels among women and with the group of men. But, as Franca Rame used to say, if they don't understand, we can't move forward without men but sometimes we need to give them a little push. So, sometimes the point was to confront this conflict. That's how it was. Some took more radical positions. No talking to men, they're out, that's it. End of the line. They don't demonstrate, they don't do anything anymore. Others were more mediative, and some were more about cooperation rather than conflict. There was also a diversification of feminist groups in the Lombardy-Milan area, etc. It was another arena for many things especially in terms of responsibility and commitment. Not feeling alone, not feeling out of place because we dared not to conform to the mainstream of those years, to critique what we were doing while we were doing it. If there's something that revitalized and drove the movement in those years, it was the contribution of women the more liberated thinking that emerged on issues that women brought to the forefront, primarily the critique of power structures. Women raised the issue of power, otherwise it wouldn't have been raised. It wasn't just about seizing power. It was about what to do with it afterward. What did it mean to have it? It seemed like not a problem at the time, but there were examples to look at, such as forms of leadership, violence, machismo, roles, etc. All of this was deconstructed and reformulated in terms that, in my opinion, are still valuable today. What I found to be very important, and even though it's different today, I feel like I can still emphasize it by putting it into context, is the interplay between what you feel is happening in your inner world and what you can try to see, experience and act upon in the external world. This attention to oneself, self-care, a self that is never defined or final but is in motion, under construction, something you feel inside and belongs to you, that shapes you, that exists, and the feedback you receive from the world. This inner outer attention, I believe, is extremely vital and important. I would say to young women, nurture it, nurture it. It can be reading, being silent, hiking in the mountains, writing poetry, but then going out, talking, engaging, being in a group. Cultivate this front, this permeability, the interplay of the inner with the outer, without sacrificing one or the other, because they are vital when they coexist. If you take away a piece of these things, a part, a component, you impoverish yourself greatly, you become sadder, and I think we all, as women, maybe even everyone, become diminished. I don't know how to put it. If you cultivate sisterhood, you usually create it and find it. 
It's like a self-reproductive, generative, autopoietic system where you cultivate sisterhood, seek intense and important relationships, even if they're conflictual but significant, sincere ones that help you look at yourself and the world. I believe this is something that benefits all of us, especially women today. Given how the world is going, perhaps women still have more road to travel and more challenges to face today. Thank you for joining us on this incredible journey through the voices and stories of remarkable women from 1970s Italy. Their testimonies have illuminated the past and offered us valuable insights into an era of change, activism and resilience. As we conclude this podcast, let's take a moment to reflect on the powerful narratives we've encountered. These women from various backgrounds and experiences shared their struggles and triumphs, each contributing to the vibrant tapestry of history. We've heard about the challenges they faced, from navigating a society shaped by traditional roles to confronting the patriarchy head on. Yet their stories are not solely defined by adversity. They are stories of courage, resilience, and the unwavering belief in a brighter future. The 1970s in Italy were a time of upheaval, a period where these women courageously stepped forward to challenge the status quo. Their actions paved the way for progress in gender equality, social justice, and political reform. As we move forward, let's remember the lessons learned from these women's experiences. Let's honor their contributions by continuing the fight for equality and justice in our own time. Their voices have inspired us to listen, learn, and take action. Let's ensure that their stories are not forgotten, but rather serve as a catalyst for positive change. Thank you for joining us on this journey through the testimonies of remarkable women from the 1970s in Italy. We hope you carry their stories with you and continue to be agents of change in your own lives and communities. Together, we can build a brighter future for all of us. This podcast is produced in the scope of the project Female Perspectives on the Democratic Transitions in the 1970s, 1980s and 1990s. The project is co-financed by the European Union. Views and opinions expressed are, however, those of the authors only and do not necessarily reflect those of the European Union or EACA. Neither the European Union nor the granting authority can be held responsible for them.